Continuing our coverage of the Supreme Court case King versus Burwell, which uh, involves the subsidies available to citizens who buy their health insurance on exchanges in 34 states in this country where the federal government had to step in and set up the health care exchanges. With me is Brian Boitler, who has literally just walked out of the Supreme Court after hearing the oral arguments in this case. Brian, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, give me your sense. I mean, a lot of people, um, the, the big deal about the oral arguments is, is simply it's, I guess, a more... Uh, the uh, more descriptive tea leaves. Right. Yeah. It's it's the one place where you can maybe see the justices sort of tip their hands as to how uh, they're going to ultimately rule. In 2012, John Roberts kind of subtly tipped his hand as to how he would rule uh, when he when he talked about uh, the possibility that the individual mandate was just this generalized tax incentive incentive, and lo and behold, that's how he ruled. Uh, so that's the benefit of the oral arguments, and I think that we saw some glimmers of hope for supporters of the law in uh, in today's arguments. All right, let's just do, let's just just start with actually some of the sort of the more uh, practical mechanical aspects right. of it. How long are the oral arguments uh, in this case? Um, how many people come sit in there? I obviously not many people get the opportunity to sit in on a Supreme Court oral argument. Oh, there there were there were scores and scores of people, including senators, members of Congress. It was it was packed to the gills. It was at capacity. Um, the press risers were, or I guess the press section was just as crammed uh, today as it was for the three days of oral arguments in 2012, uh, when there was a constitutional challenge to the law. Um, so and we should say those three days that was pretty unique. You don't get oral arguments that last that long. Yeah, the the, the issues in that case were much weightier. They they touched on on constitutional concerns. This is just a case about whether the technical wording of the law authorizes the subsidies in those 34 states. Uh, so they didn't need nearly as much time to, to bore into the issue as they did back in 2012. But the stakes are almost similarly high in that if the challengers win, the damage to the law will be very grave. That's right. And so uh, so you go in there, There's uh, the, the courtroom is packed full of senators, journalists, I guess some advocates as well. Right. Uh, it should be said that the, the, the senators and the people who wait in line, uh, they get to sit right in the in the in what you might call the orchestra section. I don't know what, the, what it's actually called of the Supreme Court where they can look uh, straight ahead and see all the justices up on the dais. Uh, for the most part, reporters are confined to a section that's sort of behind the curtain and behind these marble pillars. And so unless you're situated uh, very luckily, and I actually had a pretty decent seat this time. You normally can't see anything. You might be able to see a few justices. I was able to see three uh, justices: um, Kagan, uh, Alito, uh, and Ginsburg. Um, but you're you're basically, if you're reporting on this, you you can't really see very well, and, and you're generally you, you need to do a very good job of making sure that you know what the justices sound like, that you're taking your notes correctly, because you're not allowed uh, to record it. And obviously, since you can't see it, you're not. 100% sure who's speaking if you don't know what they sound like. Wow. All yeah. right. So there's a, there's a certain amount of possible jeopardy for, right, a, right, uh, right, for right, a reporter. Right. Okay. So, uh, so, so give us your sense. I mean, in the, uh, there's 30 minutes for the uh, petitioners, the plaintiffs, uh, to make their case, and that's followed by 30 minutes from the, the government in this case? That was the schedule. Uh, in, in real time, the Chief Justice granted uh, the, the challenger's attorney, Michael Carvin, 10 extra minutes, and that therefore meant the governor, uh, the government's a attorney, Don Verrilli, got 10 extra minutes. So it was scheduled to go an hour. It probably went closer to an hour and a half. Okay. Um, and so uh, give us a sense of uh, what, uh, let's hear the, what the tea leaves were. So uh, it, it, it probably won't su surprise your listeners to know that, that since, um, well, the, the challenger's attorney, Michael Carvin, went first. He's positing this case that, that the Affordable Care Act, uh, both both by, uh, by word and by design, uh, prohibit subsidies in these 34 states. So he encountered a lot of skeptical questioning from the four liberal liberal justices. Um, for the most part, they dominated the questioning of him. Uh, he was bailed out a couple times by Justices uh, Alito and Scalia when he kind of um, found himself a little bit trapped by their questioning. Uh, but but for the most part, um, the first half of the of the argument was uh, was those four liberal justices expressing incredible skepticism of his argument. And, so and, and, and the, the skepticism centered around what? 
Well, it, it, uh, several things. One, the idea that, that his construction is the only reasonable one, that, that it says uh, subsidies are available through an exchange established by the state appears um, appears clear un un unless you look at other parts of the statute which say that if a state doesn't establish its own exchange, then HHS will come in and establish such exchange that you can just substitute in. Uh, okay, so they, they, one was they're, they're reading those four words too narrowly. Right. They're not looking in the context of everything else. That's one a line of attack. My mm -hmm. understanding is Ginsburg also raised standing. Is that uh, right? Ginsburg raised standing, but, but um, both in, in his response to her questions and then when um, when General Verrilli uh, addressed standing, it, it seems like the standing issue has been resolved, that that um, at least one but probably more of the four plaintiffs have standing. Um, the, the, the government didn't really dispute it, kind of left it hanging as a question for the challengers to address. They said they didn't have the information to, to know for certain whether any of the four were uh, uh, subject to the mandate in 2014, and that's the question for standing. And... Uh, and the uh, general really settled later that yes indeed some of his uh, at least some of his um, clients were indeed um, subject to the mandate in 2014 so okay. that's the standing question um, so that was one thing they they, they, they they made pretty short shrift of that uh, the liberal uh, justices were very concerned that his uh, that the challenges reading was too narrow that it created a series of very severe anomalies elsewhere in the statute uh, that it rendered the scheme largely unworkable. Um, that was sort of the core of it. But but the uh, the, the most important part of that uh, first half is that Anthony Kennedy, one of the one of the conservatives, chimed in to say that he believed that the that the challenger's construction of the statute would make it unconstitutionally coercive. Okay, so just to recap here, from the liberal perspective, the idea was the by using the, by isolating those four or five words. You're 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 not taking in the broader context of the law. Also, um, this would render the law basically dysfunctional, and there is a a typical uh, hesitancy of the courts to do such a thing to the legislation. Correct. Um, the uh, the idea that like the intent couldn't have been this way. They, they, they even language aside, why would Congress right. ever pass a law that was doomed to fail right. from the beginning? It's like building a car and saying, which specifically you're not going to put an engine in or right, drivetrain. Right, right. There was, there was a, there was a good uh, analogy to the idea that Congress could say that states uh, must create airports. If not, the federal government will come in and build such airport. Uh, you would resolve the question as to as to whether one was a state established airport or a federally established airport if the government then said you can only land your airplanes at an air an airport established by the state well obviously that would have to encompass all airports otherwise you have these useless airports right, right. there's no reason right. to do that so so uh, two or three of the thing the questions raised were sort of generic on some level um, and uh, or uh, broader principles. Right. One was uh, the way in which uh, uh, also the, uh, I guess all three were just sort of broader principles. Of well, the, the, uh, they, the, um, Justice Breyer uh, was very explicit that he thought that this was a very clear cut, um, clear cut substitution issue where you have a term of art, an exchange established by the state, where the preference is for the state to establish that exchange, but that if the state does not do so, then the federal government will come in and establish such exchange. You just plug federal government into that other part of the statute and you resolve the uh, supposed conflict. And then Kennedy comes in with the principle that actually uh, at least made, left hundreds of thousands, I guess maybe millions of people without Medicaid, Right. Um, made that principle, which is this idea that if the federal government had intended to punish states by not giving them subsidies, that would be too coercive as if uh, they were saying, if you don't take the expanded Medicaid, you don't get any Medicaid. Well, it was it, his his argument was uh, was actually farther reaching than that because he wasn't just concerned about the loss of the subsidies, right? He was concerned about the imposition, therefore, of a unworkable regulatory scheme. If the subsidies disappear, then for most people, the mandate disappears, and without a mandate, you're left with this requirement that insurance companies sell insurance to everybody and rate the cost of the insurance based on how healthy the overall population is, but you don't have enough customers uh, to make sure that that system works. You have just sick people in the pool. So the, so, so his concern was not just that these uh, subsidies would disappear for the people, but that the state would be saddled with this unworkable system, 
uh, and, and that, it, that it is um, not rational for any state to accept, uh, accept a death spiral in their insurance market um, and that, that that is just coercion. Okay, so that, that the, the idea of, uh, of trying, leaving the state in that situation is coercive of the federal government, right? Right, Are exactly. you also suggesting that he was like saying that it would be regulatory overreach no, by no. the federal government to inhibit the, the, the sort of the business of insurance companies? Here's how I would put it. He's that sort very, of a bank shot? He's very concerned about making sure that statutes don't, uh, don't upset the sort of federal state balance that the, that the, the federal government isn't trampling on states with, with its laws. Um, in, in the case of Medicaid, that was basically just about money. Either you take this Medicaid expansion or you lose all of your Medicaid money uh, was coercive because it just gave the states a, sort of a Hobson's choice. They couldn't really turn down the expansion right. because too much was at, at stake. But that was basically all about money. In this case, his concern about the intrusion on the states is partially about money and that the subsidies would disappear for state citizens, but also that the, the uh, regulatory regime uh, or artifact that would be left behind uh, by a state declining to establish an exchange would be, um, would be uh, disastrous for the state and that the state didn't have any notice of this. This is not a very like, generous way to treat states, and, and Anthony Kennedy is very skeptical uh, of laws that, um, or interpretations of laws uh, that, that intrude on states in that way. So um, as far as asking the, um, the, the challengers, uh, the plaintiffs in this case, any uh, other sort of more pointed questions, Scalia, Thomas, well, Thomas <laughs> doesn't say anything anyways, uh, but uh, Scalia, Alito, what about Roberts? Did a so, Rob? So, uh, so we know that the four liberals, they all seem very skeptical of the challenge. And we know that Anthony Kennedy seems skeptical of the challenger's construction of the statute, which is good because the four liberals aren't enough to save the law. You need a fifth. So it looks like it could be Kennedy, but if it's not Kennedy, it could be Roberts because Roberts, in, in a, I think this is unusual for him, he said almost nothing throughout the whole oral argument. He wasn't quite as quiet as Clarence Thomas, but uh, he, he spoke up only to sort of direct traffic, and make uh, sort of one kind of cute remark and that's it he didn't he didn't like to call box and, uh, balls and strikes <laughs> right <laughs> I, 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 I suppose it would it would be it would be unusual for him I think he has a tendency to sort of um, you know pepper uh, attorneys with with pointed questions when he's intending to or when he when he believes that their argument is susceptible to an adverse ruling and he said nothing so he clearly wants to keep his cards close to the vest uh -huh. doesn't really tell us anything about how he'll ultimately rule, but he's a wild card, right? So you have the four seemingly locked in liberal justices, Anthony Kennedy sort of suggesting that he wants to avoid this unconstitutional reading of the law, and so he might therefore buy this other argument, and, uh, and then maybe Roberts. So you have a, a universe of six justices that could uh, vote to sustain the subsidies. Um, Alito and Scalia seemed like lost causes. Their knives were out for Obamacare right away. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that they'll turn around and say, actually, the government deserves deference uh, over these subsidies. Um, could happen, but I doubt it. And uh, was there anything that was um, equally as revealing during the questioning of the, the government, when the government came up, when uh, uh, Varelli was there? I mean, it sounds like... Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, it makes sense to me, to a certain extent, that the challenger would be that's the most telling exchange, although it depends. I mean, I think there's been occasions, I feel like the last round, the, the some of the justices were almost carrying the, the plaintiff's argument into the argument with the, uh, the government Th more forcefully sometimes than the plaintiffs were. In, 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 in both cases, um, in both attorneys needed help uh, at, at various points. I, uh, Michael Carvin, the the challenger's attorney seemed to need a little bit more help, and he got bailed out by Scalia and Alito. Um, uh, one time that I can recall off the top of my head, uh, really, I you know, uh, forget which liberal justice came to his aid. It would, both attorneys did a pretty strong job uh, overall in presenting their cases. Um, what was most revealing during the, the government's argument was that Robert spoke up again, and he, uh, without being prompted, he said, uh, if, if you'll allow me, I could even just uh, just pull up the exact quote. Of course. I have it here. If you just give me one second. Um, he said, if petitioner's argument is correct, this is just not a rational choice for the states to make, 
and that they're being coerced and that you then have to invoke the standard of constitutional avoidance. So he said without being prompted that, you know, he might, he's not certain that the, that the challengers have the better read on the statute. But if they do, if they have the, if they have the, mo the only cl correct or, or plausible read on the statute, they still shouldn't win because he was, he was, he'd adopted Kennedy's argument. That, that was Kennedy. Did I, uh, oh, yeah, I know. You said it was Roberts. I, I apologize. Okay. No, Roberts was very quiet throughout the thing. This was Kennedy. He spoke up again, and, and that's what he said. Um, so just so people are clear, what Kennedy is saying that even if the plaintiffs were to prevail on their interpretation of the statute, that would move the statute into an area where it would have constitutional problems because of this, this dynamic. And that it's thing. incumbent upon the court to avoid interpreting a statute in a way that renders it unconstitutional. That was uh, something Kennedy set on his own. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't nudged in that direction uh, or he wasn't responding to anything that, that Don Verrilli said. It, it just, he, he kept coming back to this point that I don't like this construction because it's, it's very coercive. So case. now you can't see the look on Scalia's face when Kennedy raises this, right? Or Alito. I, you know, I could I mean, see a Kennedy a little been, bit. I mean, do they know, like, and I don't know if you know this, uh, I certainly don't, but do they have a sense of like, when Kennedy goes in there, I mean, I imagine that Alito or Scalia has a good sense of where Alito is on this going in there to the extent that they even need to question where Thomas is. Um, I, have a, I have a sense that they would know. But do they know that Kennedy's going to say something like this? Do they know that Kennedy's been going around the halls going like, I don't know. I mean, or I, I, my sense is that they, they all say very little to each other before the arguments, but that everyone knows this about Kennedy, that he... Um, he's a stickler about this federalism issue, um, and when the, when this the interesting thing is when this case was before this case was devised when when conservatives first identified this term ex exchange established by the state um, it was before the IRS said subsidies go everywhere so they were prepared to argue that the law made subsidies conditional on states setting up their own exchanges and that this would be coercive and they they liked that argument because they knew that it would appeal to Kennedy. Fast forward a few months, the IRS says subsidies go everywhere. Now they flip, and they say they want to enforce that coercive property of the law, which just flips Kennedy's position. Suddenly, they're asking uh, the court to impose this very coercive structure on states, and um, their, their concern becomes not winning Kennedy over but not losing him because they're— uh, they're positing such a co coercive reading. Interesting. Of the law. So the same principle they thought could cut their way, and then they realized in practice it doesn't. Um, right. And, and I mean, so didn't wasn't Scalia? I mean, presumably there were four people, right, who signed off on this. We don't know who they are, and it's conceivable one of them was a liberal justice, right? So saying like, well, I'll do you a solid, the, uh, the, Scalia. Uh, or conventional wisdom is that since there was no need for the court to take this, that the only reason it, it, it would have taken it is if there were four justices who were really primed um, to, to uh, overturn the King ruling in the Fourth Circuit, which upheld the subsidies. Um, I think smart money is on that it was um, the four justices who, uh, who voted to uh, declare Obamacare unconstitutional back in 2012. So that includes Kennedy. That includes Kennedy. Now, he's, now he sort of sees the... Uh, the entire so picture. Scalia leave the chamber and walk down the hall and just look at Kennedy and just go, <laughs> what, the f what the F? I mean, what? Yeah, we had a job to do Dude. here. Uh, it could have been Roberts. There's also an, a, a, a plausible um, sort of minority opinion that because this is a, such an important case, because they knew they were going to have to pick it up eventually, because as time goes on, the law gets more entrenched, it becomes harder to let's decide. Get, let's get, let's, get, let's, let's run just, it through now and get, get it, it out. In, in which case... But, but, you know, that, I'll tell you why that doesn't seem... Why would they have to get it eventually? Because eventually there would be a circuit court that would split? Uh, the, the, this was going to come up through um, basically every circuit court in the country, probably. And the, the, the standing argument, while slightly convoluted, there are people who, if, if you buy the challenger's argument, they get hurt, right? Because they either have to buy insurance... The, that they Theoretically, right. there's going to be people out there, who, even if these four... You know, right. didn't even realize they were part of the case, right. or what, or, or were subject to the VA or Medicare or whatever it is. And and, and you know, you saw with the with the D, uh, D.C. Circuit that, that there were uh, two federal judges there that were willing to void the subsidies. Um, now that decision got voided itself, right? Uh, right. But but there you had evidence, clear evidence that this thing was going to go up into the uh, through the court system, and that 
there was a decent likelihood um, that that there would be a split and that the Supreme Court would have to take it anyway. So maybe now, like I said, a that's a minority v- right. minority view of, of, of why this case was granted. That actually the makes the most sense to me. That somebody said, let's just rip the Band-Aid off this thing, get it over with, instead of letting it dangle it's, out there. It's highly plausible. Most uh, court watchers take the alternate view, but it's it's not a crazy idea. Well, at least that clears the deck for Benghazi. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, now we don't have to worry about that, assuming, of course, that um, the indication that you got from Kennedy, and, and I've seen this echoed at least, that people seem encouraged walking out of there, at least you know the, the people that I'm encouraged to see encouraged. It was, it, was, it was striking how much more forceful he was about this constitutional issue than he was about the language of the statute or anything else. That was his core concern. Wow. All right. Well, there it is. Uh, Brian Boitler, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for, for being here with us. Thanks for having me.